My name is Indra Frank. I'm the, I serve as the Director of Environmental Health and Water Policy for the Hoosier Environmental Council. Um, and welcome to our webinar on how to write effective comments related to water permits. Um, my colleagues and I are with the Hoosier Environmental Council, which is an Indiana not-for-profit organization that has been around since 1983, working for a healthy environment and sustainable future for Indiana. Um, following today's presentation, we will be um, making the slides uh, and today's recording available on our website, and I will be sending out um, a, a link to that web page in a follow-up email um, uh, probably uh, tomorrow or the next day. Um, we will um, be taking questions and doing questions and answers following the, the presentation. But at any time during the presentation, if you happen to think of a question, please go ahead and feel free to type it into the chat um, uh, for the Q&A session at the end. Um, and with that, Kim, if you could start the slides, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, today's webinar is entitled Drafting Effective Comments on Water and Wetland Related Permits. And with the next slide, there was a part one webinar that we presented back in November um, entitled How to Watchdog Water and Wetland Permits. And in that first one, we went over the basics of the water regulatory process, how to track water permits, and how to prioritize which permits to comment on. That recording is available on our website, and it'll be on the same page as the recording for today's um, webinar when I send out that link. And as part of putting together this informational series, um, uh, my colleagues and I also drafted a written document, a citizen guide to watchdogging water and wetland permits. Um, and here I have to give chief credit to our colleague, Susie McGovern, um, who's um, also, also with us today. And the, the written guide includes um, links to the regulatory agencies, how to find uh, permitting materials um, and the prioritization process when, when sorting through um, what permits are available for comment. So if you could go to the next slide. I am trying. Hmm. There we go. Fantastic. So our chief presenter today is um, my colleague, Kim Ferraro. Kim has served as HEC's senior staff attorney for more than a decade. She has achieved several legal victories that have helped communities impacted by industrial pollution, factory farm waste, reckless residential development, and coal ash contamination. Her most recent victory was in overturning a flawed jurisdictional determination of the Army Corps of Engineers that followed a large factory farm, oh, excuse me, that allowed a large factory farm to be built in one of the most ecologically sensitive and historically significant areas of the state, the former lake bed of, lake, of Beaver Lake, once the largest inland lake in Indiana and part of the Grand Kankakee Marsh. The Army Corps had uh, provided that permit without conducting a proper wetland investigation. So that particular case, I think is um, relevant uh, to today's discussion. In that case, the Federal District Court of the Northern District of Indiana agreed with the Hoosier Environmental Council that the Corps failed to do its job in assessing whether the developer had impacted jurisdictional waters and wetlands during the construction of the confined animal feeding operation um, by failing to follow their own technical guidance, the Corps' own technical guidance, um, which required that the agency assess whether there were jurisdictional waters on the developer's property before the company substantially altered the site's hydrology. In addition, the Corps failed to follow its agency guidance for assessing whether farmed wetlands existed on the property. The Corps' decision is a critical victory for wetlands on farmland that are so often impacted under misguided view that wetlands are exempt from regulation. Um, Kim Ferraro has a law degree from Valparaiso University and a bachelor's degree from DePaul University in Chicago. She is dual licensed to practice in Indiana and Illinois and is admitted to the Northern and Southern District Courts of Indiana, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals and the US Supreme Court. So with that, please take it away, Kim. 
Thank you, Indra, and um, welcome everyone. I, I um, am pleased to be presenting uh, this uh, slideshow today on how to draft effective public comments because it is so key um, to ensuring that our, um, agent, our environmental agencies that um, issue permits to impact wetlands and, and our state waters um, uh, do it responsibly in compliance with regulation and, and ensure that irresponsible developments um, are not allowed. Um, and the public's voice, of course, is very key in, in making sure that that happens. So these are um, the three steps that I'm going to be covering today that are really involved in uh, drafting effective public comments. The first is preparation, um, which is uh, pretty time consuming, actually, and a very important key part of the whole process. Um, it requires that you obtain all the relevant documents and information about what is being proposed. Um, the next step would be uh, to review all of the documents and information that you get uh, regarding a particular proposal. Um, and as part of that review, you want to set um, realistic expectations um, as to what the agency could actually do. So in other words, the, your public comments, as we'll talk about in more detail, really can't be framed in terms of, I just don't like a project or it's bad for the environment in some way. Um, you really have to temper and understand that the agencies can only do what they're legally authorized to do. And so your comments have to be framed um, within that regulatory framework and understanding. And so as part of that, then, as you review all these documents, you're going to be uh, doing so with an eye towards identifying sort of your top two to three concerns that the agency can address. And then finally, we'll cover um, actual writing the, con uh, the comment, and I'll provide some tips um, for organization <clears throat> content and tone. So with that, um, let's get started. I've decided to go through this process by using an actual example. Um, this is a recent public notice, <clears throat> excuse me, of application to IDEM for a 401 water quality certification. Um, and I'm gonna be using this to demonstrate each of those uh, three steps as if we were gonna draft uh, public comments uh, in response to this public notice. Um, and you'll note here, um, based on the slide, that this notice tells us that a new residential subdivision is planned for Danville, Indiana, um, with a bypass road that's gonna permanently impact 856 linear feet of stream and 0.08 acres of an emergent wetland. And that seems relatively insignificant until you turn to the next page of the public notice and you see that <clears throat> the footprint of the project site is actually pretty large. Um, and it also includes what appears to be the headwaters of the East um, Fork of Mill Creek, which is not mentioned, mentioned in the text excuse me, of the public notice. Also, the public notice provides details um, for the proposed bypass road, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for, uh, in order to accomplish that for which they want to fill the streams with 8,000 cubic yards of compacted clay and then redirect those streams flow paths through a culvert. So these plans are provided with the notice. But there's no um, other information about the project, um, specifically nothing about the residential development itself, um, where this particular bypass road will be on that 400 acre site. So before you can comment, you definitely um, need more information. And so that's going to take us to, to step one um, in preparing yourself to comment and obtaining all those relevant documents. So you want to get documents about the proposed project and its impacts, the full scope of it. You're gonna need information about the laws and regulations and standards that apply to what's being proposed. Um, also useful is getting agency guidance on how the agent, technical and regulatory guidance on how the agency interprets its own rules um, and the processes that it employs in permitting. And then um, I'll cover some site specific data that you can obtain from independent sources as well that can be useful um, to your review. Of getting all this um, information, um, 
about the project and applicable laws and regulations can be especially tricky with a 401 water quality certification from the state because it's not self-evident from items public notice that an applicant for a 401 water quality certification is also necessarily applying for a section 404 permit from the Army Corps of Engineers to um, impact federally regulated waters and wetlands. As you'll see from this section of public notice that I'm emphasizing here, it mentions section 401 of the Clean Water Act, and it also mentions generally the code or the uh, regulatory provision for Indiana's state water quality standards. But nowhere in the notice is it mentioned, is, is section 404 of the Clean Water Act mentioned. So if you didn't know um, that that uh, is part of this, uh, you wouldn't know to contact the Corps. And so I want to talk a little bit more about the interplay between Section 404 and 401. And for those of you who are uh, in this field, um, wetland consultants, this may be old news to you, but uh, I think it's important to cover for folks who are not as familiar uh, with this process. So, <clears throat> excuse me, anytime... Um, there's an application uh, under 404 to the Army Corps to discharge dredger fill material into a federally regulated wetland or waters of the U.S. The Corps cannot issue the permit without getting a 401 water quality certification from the um, involved state agency. So here that would be IDEM. And uh, IDEM in this case um, also, so as part of the 401 water quality certification would be also looking at um, impacts to state isolated wetlands that would require a separate permit, but that's distinct from the 404 permitting process. Um, also important to understand is that some of the core districts, Army Corps districts here um, involved in our example is the Louisville district, don't provide public notice of receipt of applications for 404 permits. They usually will um, post the permits once they're already issued. That's not always the case, but in this particular instance, no public notice um, is available. So you need to understand this interplay so that if you see a 401 water quality certification public notice from IDEM, you need to be thinking, oh, there's also something happening at the federal level. And there's a couple of um, key pieces of information in the public notice that can help get you started um, in getting the relevant information that you need. Um, the first thing I wanna point out um, on this particular public notice is the very close um, public commenting period. You notice from March 1st to March 21st. So you get 21 days to comment, which um, isn't really a lot of time to gather all the information you need to review and write your comment. So I always suggest um, reaching out to the item project manager, um, as well as the Army Corps uh, project manager, which I'll talk about in a minute, and seeing if there's any chance you can get an extension of the comment period. Um, oftentimes they will allow that, um, and it never, uh, it never hurts to ask. Um, the other thing, so and all of that information as far as contact info for the item uh, person is provided in the public notice. Also, you'll see there's an item ID number and a Corps of Engineers um, ID number. So with that information, <clears throat> excuse me, you can uh, email the item person and request all of the um, public records relevant to the proposed project. Um, as you'll see here, you need to you know, provide the ID number, um, but there's really no magic language to this. It's, you know, we need all the records the agency has related to this public notice <clears throat> in this development. And under uh, Indiana's public records law, the agency must provide it. And uh, typically the folks involved at IDEM have no problem readily sending over the information that you request. Um, in response to our example, we received um, the developer's 160-page application um, to impact uh, the streams uh, or ephemeral channels, as it calls them, to build the bypass road um, that will serve a large 900 or so lot uh, residential subdivision. 
And we also received the developer's 105 page wetland and waters uh, delineation report, um, both of which we'll talk about uh, in a bit. From the materials we received from IDEM, um, we found the name and contact information for the project manager at Army Corps of Engineers. And with that information, we then requested, did a similar request to Army Corps to get their records. I would wanted to point out to you the first paragraph of the email that I sent to the Army Corps person. You'll notice that I referenced my colleague, Dr. Indra Frank. <laughs> um, I name dropped there um, and uh, pointed out that I had heard her speak at a Indiana Wetlands Forum um, back in October. All of this is to be personal, and you should do that. Um, it's okay. Uh, the folks who work for government agencies are people, and oftentimes when they're treated courteously, they will be um, even more willing to help you um, answer questions and provide information that you might need. Uh, so anyway, you'll see again that, um, you know, that I didn't use any magic language, but essentially I'm asking for um, all the documents and records uh, that the agency has uh, pertaining to the very specific uh, development and using the Army Corps ID number. Um, as I was mentioning about uh, being courteous, it, almost minutes after I sent uh, that email, the Army Corps project man manager immediately responded um, and said that she had been working on the project and to give her a call. Um, I did that and, and learned that she and I actually shared uh, similar concerns over this project um, uh, that I had observed just from brief review of the item application and that uh, she was going to be having the applicant submit uh, a new application because of those deficiencies. So that actually bought us more time in order to do our homework. Um, so again, I'm just pointing this out that, you know, you don't have to do everything in writing and by email, and it's good to be personal and have those one-to-one um, -one contacts with the uh, folks that work for the agency. So in addition to getting all the relevant records from IDEM and Army Corps, you'll want to educate yourself on the applicable laws and regulations. Um, one key document that will help you do that um, on the uh, 404 front is this uh, particular regulatory guidance memo um, jointly done by EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers that explains the scope of their jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. In other words, what waters are considered federally regulated and specifically those waters that are considered jurisdictional following the US Supreme Court's decisions rather famous in, in Rapanos. Uh, versus EPA. That's the case that unfortunately gave rise to all the controversy in defining uh, uh, the term waters of the U.S. and what that means. Um, more about that uh, if we have more time at the end of the conversation, if folks have questions about that. Um, at any rate, this particular guidance document, along with many other guidance documents that the core, uh, relevant ones that the core um, publishes is available on the Corps of Engineers headquarters website. Um, it is under uh, the regulatory program and permits section, and then you link down until you find Clean Water Act guidance. <clears throat> You'll also want to uh, download from the Corps website uh, the 1987 wetland delineation manual, which details how the Corps identifies wetlands in making its formal jurisdictional determinations for purposes of Section 404. Um, and a note about tech, uh, agency guidance, it isn't the law, but courts have consistently held that if the Army Corps of Engineers strays from this particular guidance from the manual, then its jurisdictional determinations, its wetland, uh, its jurisdictional determinations are um, uh, can be overturned as unlawful, um, and specifically the language is arbitrary and capricious. <clears throat> In addition to the core manual, you'll want the, the core's Midwest supplement, which replaces chapters two through five of the 1987 um, delineation manual with specific guidance for conducting wetland delineations in the Midwest region, where we have farmland that presents very unique challenges in identifying wetlands because wetland uh, vegetation may be missing due to crop farming. 
um, but the wetland soils and hydrology remain. And these, um, under case law and core guidance, these and the regulations themselves, these, um, I'll use the term farmed wetlands, are subject to Section 404 permitting if they would otherwise meet the jurisdictional test. Um, and that is if they would have a significant nexus to a waters of the United States or if they're adjacent um, to a waters of the United States. And all of that is detailed in that Rapanos memo um, that I referred to earlier. You'll also want to um, access the Corps' applicable regulations for issuing Section 404 permits and other relevant regulations regarding enforcement, public hearings, um, the definition of waters of the U.S., the appeals process, and compensatory mitigation. And then finally, you want to click down into district-specific information to find out the, um, the district's uh, particular processes for, for issuing permits. These guidance documents can be really useful because they provide not only citation to the regulant, relevant, uh, regulant excuse me, relevant regulations, but also explain um, the agency's interpretation of those regulations, which are very useful in crafting your own comments. Uh, finally, I don't want to leave item out of the mix. They have uh, a useful website that's got access to um, uh, regulations and agency guidance for um, regulation of wetlands, lakes, and streams, um, and specifically to the Section 401 water quality certification process and to the state, um, the state's regulated uh, wetlands program. Oh, and finally, one more piece of information <laughs> that I want to mention. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are um, particularly useful uh, publicly available government uh, sources of site-specific data that you can get. Um, this, this type of data is going to often be um, in the application materials itself. But I have found often that the applicants either provide um, incomplete uh, information that's more fully available through these websites and sometimes even inaccurate information. So it's critical to double check some of the information provided in the application for yourself. So that takes us to um, the review process. You've got to review all of this information and materials with an eye toward um, understanding what is being proposed, I, that's probably obvious, uh, understanding the regulatory framework that governs um, the permitting process, also probably obvious. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, as part of reviewing, keeping in mind that what you're trying to do is to identify the top two or three concerns, definitely no more than five, that an agency can actually address something that the agency can actually do within its regulatory authority. Um, you can't just say, I don't like the project, um, so you should deny the permit request. Um, I want to mention that the, the review of all of these materials and going through these stages of understanding what's being uh, proposed and understanding the regulatory uh, framework and issue spotting, it's an iterative process. Um, each stage may be uh, may need to be repeated, revised, and refined as you review. Um, also, these materials are voluminous, so it's important to take notes, uh, use a highlighter, sticky notes, uh, or whatever system works for you to capture important information in one place that you can refer uh, back to when you start drafting your comments. Um, now, since I can't go through every document related to our Danville example, I'm going to point out a few documents that helped me identify um, three concerns, the top three concerns that I had um, that, in my view, IDEM and Army Corps uh, should and can address um, related to this uh, proposed project. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the first is, as you see here on the screen, it's the cover page of the applicant's um, wetland and uh, waters delineation report. Um, 
And all of these sorts of delineation reports will identify the on-site waters and wetlands that the applicant believes are subject uh, to regulation, whether that be federal regulation or state regulation. I always review these delineation reports first um, to assess whether the applicant's, applicant's conclusions are correct, because if the agencies agree with it, then the waters identified in that delineation report define the scope of the agency's authority. Um, and if, the, if it's wrong, then, and the permit gets issued based on these conclusions, then otherwise regulated waters um, will go unprotected. So here's the report of the delineation, and I want to point out uh, the four main conclusions that the applicant drew um, with respect to the existence of jurisdictional waters um, on the site, on that 400-acre site. Uh, first, uh, the consultant concluded that there are no wetlands except for a small emergent wetland, um, which the consultant concludes is likely an exempt uh, class one state regulated isolated wetland. So in the, in the consultant's view, they can fill that without getting a permit or doing mitigation or anything else. Um, second, the consultant uh, identified, quote, scattered wet areas with hydric soils, hydric soils or wetland soils um, in the row crop fields but concludes that these wet areas are not wetlands because the fields are tiled and planted in crops each year. Then the consultant identifies a considerable number of grass waterways that converge into an open stream channel, um, which refers to Mill Creek, um, but concludes that the grass waterways are not likely wetlands or waters of the U.S. Um, with no analysis of that uh, particular conclusion to support it. Um, but does conclude that Mill Creek likely is a waters of the U.S. and um, that it will be avoided by the development. And finally, um, the consultant identifies ephemeral channels to the east uh, of the property, which it uh, does conclude are WOTUS um, subsequent to the, uh, the, I think he refers to it as re-regulated, um, referring to lifting of the Trump um, rule that would have significantly um, re eliminated or um, reduced the uh, EPA and CORE's jurisdictional um, scope of their jurisdiction over waters of the U.S. Then you look at the project map, which kind of clarifies what the delineation report is talking about, and you'll see that it's a 400-acre site. Um, but critically, nothing again about the footprint of the proposed residential development, other than it's going to be built over uh, what the consultant refers to as parabolic grass waterways, um, which they conclude is not regulated. Um, that the small emergent wetland will be filled for a, a rear yard swale. Um, that the headwaters of Mill Creek will be avoided. And that 856 out of 2,800 feet of ephemeral channels to the east um, will uh, they'll be filled to build the bypass road, um, and that mitigation, offsite mitigation, will occur for those impacts. Okay, so that's what the um, developer or the applicant believes. Um, is the state of waters on this particular site. So we need, to, we need to assess that. We need to see if that's accurate. So you remember I talked about the um, CORE's wetland, uh, wetland delineation manual and the Midwest supplement. And so the first thing I wanna check out is the conclusion that those scattered wet areas with hydric soils um, are not wetland. Is that a supported conclusion? And so I reviewed um, the 87, 1987 Wetland Delineation Manual and the Midwest Supplement, which details the difficulty in identifying wetlands on agricultural land in the, in the Midwest, like we're dealing with in our example, um, and specifically uh, that throughout the Midwest, the problem is, is that vast areas of historic wetlands have been drained and converted to cropland or pastures, and that drainage might be partial, 
um, so the site will still meet wetland hydrology standards. And because of that, the Corps um, recommends that wetland determinations on current and former agricultural lands must consider whether a drainage system is present, how it's designed to function, and whether it's effective in removing uh, wetland hydrology from an area. So the applicant's conclusion in our case, in our example, that uh, to justify that those wet areas aren't wetlands simply because they're tiled and planted in crops each year, doesn't support the conclusion that those wet areas that have hydric soils are not wetlands. Doesn't say that they are, but it's not enough to conclude that they're not. The Midwest, the Corps Midwest Supplement goes on to say that in such situations like we're presented with here, a much more in-depth um, wetland investigation is required to make um, the conclusion that cropland with hydric soils and hydrology um, is not a wetland. So for example, uh, the guidance recommends examining five or more years of aerial photographs for wetness signatures, like the example provided on the screen. Um, to estimate the effects of ditches and subsurface drainage systems using scope and effect equations, using state drainage guides to estimate the effectiveness of an existing drainage system, and to actually cease the clearing or manipulation of the site for one or more growing seasons to see if um, a wetland plant community would, would return. None of that was done in this case, um, at least based on the materials that, uh, that I reviewed or that are available for this, for this project. Instead, in the application, there is one aerial photo um, from May 2020, which notably shows many dark areas um, that may have saturated soils um, that we learned from the core manual um, could be an indication of wetland hydrology. Uh, there's also soil sampling at points that um, mostly avoid those dark areas of saturation um, seen in the prior photograph. Even so, the points that were tested um, had either hydric soils or wetland vegetation. Um, so the hydric soils were seen in the red circles, those sample points, and uh, wetland vegetation uh, was found in the uh, green circled points. And at the top, uh, the blue circle had all three that uh, is representative of that small emergent wetland that they found. Um, but no information is, it was provided to support the applicant's conclusion that this wetland is only uh, 0.8 acres in size. A soil map was included in the application, but it doesn't include the underlying soil data. Um, that I did obtain independently from the NRCS Web Soil Survey, showing that this particular site has more than 77 acres of um, a hydric soil. The soil survey data also indicates that these soils frequently pond water, are poorly drained soils, and have a high water table zero to 12 inches from the surface. Um, which under core guidance could indicate wetland hydrology. But again, so this kind of exemplifies the importance of checking some of the information provided in an application yourself um, through these independent uh, publicly available sources. So all of this that I just went through um, with you <clears throat> kind of supports the first issue of concern that, that I identified. And that is to be summarized that the applicant's wetland delineation and supporting materials are insufficient to support the conclusion that the scattered wet areas with hydric soils are not wetlands. And you'll see on the, so this is um, showing the type of notes that I would be taking if I were going to be preparing myself to draft public, uh, public comments. Um, I would make note of the regulatory requirements, um, standards, or guidance here, the Corps Midwest Supplement, many pages there that talk about uh, needing a more rigorous wetland investigation than was done um, in this case uh, uh, for cropland that has wetland indicators such as hydric soils and wetland hydrology, uh, some supporting evidence that uh, we have, the soil sampling that confirms the presence of hydric soils, the soil survey data, and um, the aerial photo that shows evidence of saturated areas. And then a conclusion. So what could the agency do within its authority? 
Well, it could require the applicant to conduct um, the requisite wetland investigation that is compliant with, with core guidance. So all of this you would be able to then take um, in helping you craft your comments, which we'll talk about when we get to, to the drafting piece. Uh, going back now to the applicant's uh, wetland and waters delineation report, I, I wanted to assess the, uh, the conclusion that those uh, so-called parabolic grass waterways are not regulated um, waters of the U.S. My concern is that, um, at least based on the, the image here, uh, they span much of the site and appear to be directly connected to the headwaters of Mill Creek, which is a waters of the U.S. Um, the applicant doesn't provide any explanation and support of the conclusion um, that these grass waterways are not jurisdictional, uh, nowhere in the report or anywhere else in the application. So I went to the Rapanos memo that I referred to, which details uh, what waters are federally regulated uh, by the Corps and those that are not. Um, as it pertains to tributaries, you'll see um, that there's, so I'm looking at the very first page of this memo, which provides a real useful summary of the key points um, <clears throat> that I often refer to, to remind me of um, sort of the general uh, scope of, of which waters are regulated and which are not. So as it pertains to non-navigable tributaries, so nav traditional navigable waters like a big river, you know, that you could put a boat in, those are always subject to the Clean Water Act. They're always jurisdictional. But non-navigable tributaries of navigable waters uh, that have relatively permanent flow, um, where the tributaries typically flow year round or have continuous flow at least seasonally, typically three months, um, are also waters of the US. The agencies will assert jurisdiction over those waters. Also, <clears throat> even non-navigable trib tributaries that are found to not have relatively permanent flow could be jurisdictional if they have a significant nexus to a traditional navigable water. And the Corps decides uh, that question on, very fact, on a fact-specific analysis. Um, as you see at the bottom, the significant nexus analysis will assess the flow characteristics and functions of the tributary itself, <clears throat> excuse me, um, which uh, will include a consideration of hydrologic and ecologic um, factors. And in contrast to what the agencies will assert jurisdiction over, they categorically will not assert jurisdiction over swales or erosional features um, uh, such as gullies, small washes that are characterized by low volume, infrequent, or short duration and flow. So <clears throat> none of this assessment of the flow characteristics of um, the grass waterways is anywhere uh, evident um, in the application materials that I reviewed. Um, there's no significant nexus analysis of the flow characteristics either or their functions. I then went to the um, uh, U.S. Geological Survey uh, uh, mapping data and pulled these topographical, topographical maps, which are not contained in the application, confirming <clears throat> that this 400-acre site and its grass waterways are literally the headwaters of Mill Creek, which is a traditional navigable waterway in some sections, and Mill Creek flows to Cagles Mill Lake and ultimately uh, the White River which are also traditional navigable waterways. Significantly, uh, Cagles Mill Lake was built um, as Indiana's first flood control reservoir, protecting the Eel and White River watersheds. Um, so protecting the headwaters of the creek that feeds this lake would seem to be um, deserving a very careful analysis before we allow a development to, to destroy the watershed. Um, of that creek. So in my notes, um, I document this uh, second issue of key concern that the applicant's conclusion 
uh, on the grass waterways as not being waters of the U.S. Uh, is not at this point su uh, supported. We just don't have the information. The agencies don't have the information they need to make that conclusion. Again, I lay out the regulatory requirement, uh, supporting evidence, and what I would ask the agencies to do, which is to require the applicant to assess the flow characteristics of the grass waterways and whether they have a significant nexus to Mill Creek as required by um, EPA and core guidance. So the final conclusion that I wanted to assess in the uh, developer's proposal is uh, the proposal to impact and provide offsite mitigation for filling the ephemeral cham channels that are on the east side of the property, um, which the applicant confirms are our WOTUS, our waters of the US. And to do that, <clears throat> I looked at core guidance. Um, I'm sorry, I, think I skipped ahead here. Nope. But to do that, I looked at, at core guidance, um, which explains that, a prick of, that uh, no discharge of dredge or fill material shall be permitted if there's a practicable alternative to the proposed discharge, which would have less adverse impact on the aquatic ecosystem. And this analysis of alternatives is required in every case that a 404 permit um, uh, is sought um, to impact uh, waters of the U.S. Um, that would involve a practical alternatives analysis, would look at those alternatives that are available and capable of being done after taking into consideration cost, existing technology, and logistics in light of the overall project purposes. Um, the reg the uh, core guidance also tells us that uh, impacts or the process, the evaluation process that the Corps follows is to first look at whether impacts to the aquatic environment can be avoided to the maximum extent practical, practicable by evaluating alternative sites and alternative project configurations on site. Once avoidance has been ma maximized, direct and indirect impacts on the aqua aquatic environment are to be minimized to the extent that they can. And finally, unavoidable adverse impacts <clears throat> are fully offset by compensatory mitigation. So in other words, you don't get to mitigation as our example does here without first assessing, um, without first doing this alternatives analysis. And nowhere uh, in the application do we see that. Uh, item similarly requires applicants to demonstrate that their proposed impacts are unavoidable and minimized, and the agency will deny applications for 401 water quality certification if an impact can be avoided or is unnecessary or an application is incomplete, which is the situation here, the section of the application um, where the developer should have provided that alternatives analysis is, um, is completely left blank. So in my notes, this is a pretty straightforward issue. Um, the third issue of concern is that the applicant has not demonstrated um, that it has evaluated any reasonable or practicable alternatives to impacting on-site waters or how unavoidable impacts have been minimized. I provide the CFR uh, regulatory requirement. The supporting evidence is the application itself. And what should the agencies do? Require the applicant to submit an alternatives analysis as required. So we've done our review. We've identified three, um, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, three key issues. And so next we wanna get to drafting a comment. I've started doing that in this case. Um, haven't completed, but I think the beginning draft will be useful uh, in walking through some of the tips and suggestions that I have for drafting an effective comment. Um, while it might be obvious, I, <laughs> the first thing you have to do is to identify what you're talking about. So um, you'll see in this uh, 
bolded regarding um, section here. I've identified the document title. Um, I've provided both the course ID number and the uh, item ID number so that there's no ambiguity about what my comment is about. Um, in your first paragraph, you'll want to identify yourself, um, who you represent, um, establish why the agency should listen to you. Um, what is your interest? Why are you a credible voice? Um, and clearly state your, your objective. Um, you can see here that I reference that I'm writing on behalf of the Hoosier Environmental Council, um, a little bit about what HEC does and that it represents thousands of supporters state, statewide who care about protecting wetlands. So that gives the agency some reason to listen. Um, I'm not just some random person who decided to submit a comment. Um, <clears throat> and you can do that, uh, obviously personalize your own comment to, to suit um, to suit the situation that, that uh, you're addressing. Um, you also, in the very beginning, want to define acronyms. Um, if you're gonna refer to the Hoosier Environmental Council as I do to HEC, you need to say that. Um, same with parties and key documents that you're referring to. So I don't wanna have to keep saying section 404 permit from the Army Corps of Engineers and related state 401 state water quality certification. So I'm just going to abbreviate that and refer it throughout my comment as the 404-401 application. I'm going to refer to Army Corps as the Corps, IDEM as IDEM, uh, the name of the developer. I'm just going to refer to the developer as the developer after identifying. And this just makes it easier um, to so that everybody is clear about who you're talking about in your comments. Um, so then the first thing you want to do before you start diving into the detail um, of each issue is to summarize the key concerns that you're going to raise. So <clears throat> this is something that I actually learned in law school in legal writing. Um, they teach you, you know, to tell the court what you're going to say, say it, and then say what you've said. And that's kind of the whole, um, that's, that's the same format that we're going to do here. So the first thing you want to do is say what you're going to say, summarize it, be clear, be concise, um, identify the three concerns that you raised so that right off the bat, the agencies know um, where you're going with, with your comment. I also recommend using headings for each of the key issues so that it flows and so it's clear um, when you make a transition from one um, topic to another. Um, emphasize those headings with bold italics or an underlined font. Um, there's no magic to that, whatever you prefer. Um, and then start each section with an introductory paragraph that succinctly states your argument for that section. Um, so you'll see here, my first issue is talking about um, how the wetland uh, uh, delineation um, submitted with the application, uh, it do doesn't provide a sufficient analysis or um, facts to support the conclusion that the wet areas with, with hydric soils are not wetlands simply because this is a farm field with, with drain tiles. And so I say that very clearly, this is what I'm going to be arguing about. Then each of my paragraphs that follow are supporting uh, paragraphs that either describe the legal standard, regula regulatory requirements, and evidence that support this particular argument. So you want to keep everything in one section together. You have your heading your key argument up front and supporting uh, paragraphs that support that key argument. As you write, um, maybe this is obvious, but it, I think it's a good reminder. Um, you should use good writing practices. Use topic sentences. Don't use run-ons. Keep each sentence un under 50 words. Use the active voice and avoid dense blocks of text. If you do have something that's pretty lengthy, do what I did here, use bullet points or something that helps kind of break up um, the list or the long uh, passage. Uh, certainly, I'm sorry, I almost skipped one there. Um, 
the, the second uh, suggestion is to phrase your comments as objective, fact-based statements, not beliefs or theories. I, I've seen people say, you know, I think or I believe. Those aren't as compelling as just saying it. Just say what you want to say. Make sure that you can back it up. Um, support it with your evidence um, or citation to regulatory requirements. Whatever it is you're saying, cite it. And I recommend using footnotes or in, in notes uh, to cite your sources so that they don't confuse um, and get in the way of what you're trying to say. And then you wanna conclude each section with a very clear conclusion, two or three sentences um, saying what you just said and what you want the agency to do to address that particular issue. And you're gonna do that for each of the issues, the key issues that you raise, topic sentence or paragraph that states the argument, supporting paragraphs with citation to relevant law and evidence, and a section conclusion. You do that for each one, conclude your comments um, with two or three sentences that summarizes the entire comment and what you want the agency to do. There are um, several examples on HEC's website of technical comments that we have submitted to IDEM uh, and Army Corps of Engineers that you can look at and download um, to see a complete comment. Some final considerations that I think are worth uh, mentioning is it's really key to um, convey a respectful and professional uh, message in your comments, agency staff are public servants who are just trying to do their job. Um, they oftentimes have hundreds of other comments to review um, and it isn't going to be useful um, or persuasive to attack their credibility, their motives or integrity. Um, even if you're particularly passionate um, and understandably so about a particular project or think that it's completely ill-advised um, don't let that be reflected uh, in your comment. Also, be accurate. Don't overstate your case or embellish um, facts. Just stick to the facts. They're always much more um, compelling anyway. And if you do overstate or embellish, it undermines your credibility. Uh, make sure you follow the procedures given in the public notice for submitting the comment. Uh, sometimes they're by email. Sometimes uh, are they allowed by email? Sometimes they require um, that the comments be uh, uh, submitted in a hard copy paper form. And then once you do it, always ask for confirmation that, that the comment was received. I know I covered quite a bit of information today, uh, but it's useful. I'm going to make these slides available for anybody who wants them. And I went longer than I wanted to, but hopefully we have time uh, for a few questions. We do have time. Kim, thank you so much. I know that was helpful to me and I hope it was helpful to everyone else. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat already. Um, very excellent questions. Please feel free to add more into the chat or use the Zoom um, reactions menu, menu and you can um, click on raise my hand. Um, the first question is, what kinds of credibility would you suggest citizens use when making comments? It would seem to be a given that anyone who comments should be taken seriously, unless there are no obvious signs of lack of credibility, but um, that's a very good question. Um, and that's a great question. Um, there are a couple things you can do. One um, is to really emphasize your significant interest. If you're a, a nearby landowner or a resident who will be impacted, emphasize that um, because that uh, is always something that the agencies are charged with, you know, considering impacts on, or often they're charged with considering impacts on adjacent landowners. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you have any um, special expertise, if you're a scientist or a lawyer or um, whatever your profession is, um, to the extent that it demonstrates your capabilities and skills, it's okay to mention that as well. Um, really, there's no one right or wrong way to do it, um, but mainly just to personalize yourself um, and uh, the interest that you have in, in the particular uh, project being proposed. Yeah, good point. And then um, there's a question about um, links to letter, 
you know, the letter template or example letters. And um, we're definitely going to be um, providing that in our follow-up email. So we're going to put together a web page with this recording, the previous recording about uh, tracking permits, um, the link to the citizen's guide, and then uh, example comment letters. Um, and we have an enthusiastic request for the slides. Good reminder, yes, we'll, we'll be including the slides as well. Um, let's see. And then um, a question, it would be great to have a packet of the relevant guidance documents. For example, the Rapanos memo, memo and the um, core, some of the core documents. Um, Kim, what do you think? Should we then in, sort of build that into this web page that we've been talking about? I am about? down with that. I think that's yeah. a great idea. Um, in fact, I have those documents readily available all the time on my uh, desktop computer. So it would be very easy to just uh, compile those and make them available on HEC's website. Mm -hmm. It would. Yeah, David, that was your question. Did you want to unmute? Any follow-up? No, I think that's great because a lot of times people get dissuaded by having to gather together those initial documents, which are going to be useful uh, every time you make some comment on a 401-404 application. Um, and of course, the other thing that that is hard to figure out if you don't do this all the time is, wait a minute, that's 1997, 1986? What? They can't possibly be relevant anymore. So somehow we need some easy way for folks to say, hey, this is the relevant document. This is the one you should be using. That is a great suggestion. I, and I will make sure it happens, David. Yeah, no, that, that is good. Um, we also are gonna have a recording of this uh, presentation available, right, Indra? Yes, that's right. Yeah, this recording will be available as well. Um, yeah, and going back to the question of, you know, citizen involvement in the comments, um, you can provide, if it, particularly if you're commenting on waters that are near where you live or waters that you've interacted with, you can provide insight to that site that the agency may not have. Um, and, you know, that um, that is part of... Um, sort of the benefit of, of citizen commenting as well. That is an excellent point. Yeah, you're there on the ground. Uh, it's very difficult, you know, just looking at application materials to get a real sense of what's going on in a particular setting. Mm -hmm. And then um, one more question, how much assistance can HEC provide when issues pop up? Well, that is a great question. Um, we actually have a, a somewhat, I guess it's not a fledgling program anymore. It's been around for a little bit, but uh, our colleague Susie McGovern is heading up our um, water watchdogging uh, program. Um, she is, is looking for volunteers to help um, review permits. And she's also uh, reviewing requests for technical assistance when folks need help with public comments. So you can reach her um, if you just go to HEC's website, uh, hecweb.org, um, go to our staff page and find Susie McGovern's email, uh, email her and she'll hook you up with uh, the right folks that might be able to help uh, with assistance in public commenting. Yeah, and then Kim, would this also be a, a good time to mention the the request for technical assistance page Ooh. that that's on HEC's website as well. It is. Yeah, that's another that's more. I mean, yes, it is for technical assistance as well. Um, most of the requests we get through there are for legal assistance for legal representation. But definitely, if you need tech, technical assistance, there's a form you can fill out to give us more information about your request. In fact, and we I'm, can, yeah, we can provide that link. I think you said you're going to do a follow-up email, right, Indra? I am. I'm going to put that particular link in the chat right now. So this is the HEC Tech Assistance um, request. All right. Wonderful. I think we have one minute left. Any more? Any more questions?
I have to oh. say, I'm, I'm glad I got through in an hour. I was a little worried there for a little bit. That was a lot of information. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kim, for putting that all together for us. And um, thank you all for being with us today for um, the presentation. And please look for the, the follow-up email with the, the links to the, uh, to the webpage. So we'll, we'll close out there. Great. Thank you. Take care.